Good morning, everybody. We Today is August 2nd, and we are reading from 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. The book of Thessalonians is an exciting book because uh, it deals with, well, it comes from the perspective of a very young church. Paul had uh, not been here very long, and they had this wonderful uh, number of people that came to Christ. Uh, Paul didn't have the greatest reputation as pastor. It's interesting. I've often considered if Paul had been candidating for a church to become their pastor and he were to give them uh, the credentials that he had, they probably would have, uh, that's not, they would have said, that's not the man we want. I mean, what would his, uh, you know, what would his, uh, uh, reputation of Ben. Well, he, you know, he didn't stay in any town very long, didn't stay in any church for very long. Wherever he went, there were riots, and uh, uh, he was driven out of many of these places. Uh, he, he was, uh, he, you know, he caused turmoil and conflict and strife. Not the kind of characteristics that you typically would want in the selection of a pastor. But yet, at the same time, it's amazing that in, in Thessalonia here that uh, Paul hadn't been there very long and had wonderful work and many people coming to Jesus Christ. And so you got this young church and Paul is trying to encourage them. Notice what he says in verse 2 as he again identifies the, pre, the significance of priority of prayer. He says, we give thanks to God always for you all making mention of you in our prayers. I think that that's a significant statement because a lot of times we can get the attitude, hey, if I don't labor in uh, prayer, you know, for extensive time, amount of time, I, I'm, you know, it's not really uh, a value pr valid, valued prayer. And so sometimes we think long prayer is more valued prayer. And yet in this passage of Scripture, Paul's just saying, hey, I'm making mention of your prayers. You know how much more effective we could be if we could just speak names of churches and individuals and make mention of them in our prayers and that those, those are petitions that are going up to God. I would encourage you, as Paul practiced it, that we would begin practicing that, making mention of people, making mention of uh, situations to God in prayer. Then he says, remember, in verse 3, and what was it? He was remembering uh, their labor of love. He's remembering their patience. He's remembering their hope that they have in Jesus Christ. And, and, and he identifies the power source, though. Look at that in verse 5. For our gospel did not come to you in word only, only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance. So Paul is making it crystal clear here that it, this is not just, this isn't skill or, you know, uh, giftedness, natural abilities. He, he's speaking about the power source of the Holy Spirit. You should receive power. After that, the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And so this is being evidence that the gospel, the effectiveness of the gospel penetrating this this area that uh, uh, so quickly was a result of the, not of their clever words, but because of the power of the Spirit of God. Now, in verse 6, he, it almost sounds conflictive here because he says, um, You become followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction, with joy in the Holy Spirit. So he's, he's saying to them, hey, listen, you follow us and the Lord. And, and, ho and hopefully we're living in such a way that we're able to tell people we become a model and example. And Paul was saying, hey, w we can be your example. We can be your source of encouragement. So you can follow us, but don't just follow us. Follow the Lord Jesus Christ as well. But then he says, having experienced or received the word in much affliction and the joy of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes that's exactly what happens, isn't it? There's the cost of the cross. And then there is the joy of the Lord. And these two things sometimes, because there's a price in living the Christian life. And there are, you know, there's the expected tribulation, trials, and persecutions that come for living for Christ. But at the other side, there is a joy unspeakable and full of glory. And, uh, and Paul is dealing with sometimes that, that what we feel. Sometimes we wake up and we feel the heaviness and the burden of, of the price of the Christian life. Other times we live in the moment of, of ecstasy, you know, as we experience the joy uh, of the, and the fruit of our labors. Look in verse 8. He says, for from you the word of the Lord has sounded forth. Isn't that something to think about, that from you, from me, has the potential, the word of the Lord to be sounded forth like trumpets that we're able to go out and wherever we go because you're going places that I won't go and you're meeting people that I won't meet. And then when we begin to recognize that the word of the Lord is going forth, we receive the word inwardly, the word of Christ, so that we live in the overflow, so that when we go out, we then are able to be channels 
of this word uh, being declared. Now, he said, your faith toward God has gone out. And then he says, uh, this, uh, and you turn to God, and he talks about their life and the transition, how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and the true God. Now look what he says in verse uh, 10, and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. You know, he, he's identifying the power of your faith and recognizing, hey, you're not who you once were. You're not who you want to be, but thank God you're not who you used to be. And, uh, and he's reminding them how they've been delivered, how they have been set free. And, and thank God for this. If we could be reminded that uh, it's Jesus who has set us free. And he's not only set us free from temporary sins, and temporary, you know, the, he's moved us from darkness to light and from the curse to being set free. But think about this, that final statement of this first book of Thessalonians, even Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. There it is again. Paul talks about a coming wrath, a coming judgment. And you know what? If, if I didn't have Jesus and you didn't have Jesus, we would, we would be, we'd be shaking in our boots because we know something that maybe the world isn't aware of and that there is a payday coming. And, and yet, we don't have to live in fear, and we don't have to con continue. And the enemy like to come and tell you, hey, you're not good enough, or, you know, you failed Jesus today, or, you know, you fell short of the potential of what God intended for you. And, and we can just get weighted down to where we just feel defeated, and we deserve, you know, to be punished. But this scripture here is reminding us that the Jesus who was raised from the dead that, that we, are, we are children of God and Jesus who's delivered us from the wrath to come. Do you realize that because you are saved through the blood of Jesus, nothing that you've done, nothing that I've done, but he has redeemed us and he's cleansed us and he's forgiven us and he's canceled the debt, that you and I are his children. And not only have we been delivered, delivered from the present darkness, we have been delivered from a wrath that is coming upon the world. We are sons of light, children of light. And uh, as a result of that, you and I ought to live with the awareness, yes, there is this conflict. That is, there is the, the strain of the world that we live in. And, and we're living in the, uh, with affliction. We've received the word with affliction, but at the same time, we're walking in the joy of the Holy Spirit. I pray today that you will be reminded by the tender, gentle tug of the Holy Spirit, that you are marked with the seal of God, that you are loved by God with a love that no human could ever express nor experience, that God loves you unconditionally and that you are his child. And I pray today that you'll walk with that assurance and that you won't live under condemnation the fact is, is you and I have not been condemned. He didn't come, the Bible says, to condemn us. And that at the same time, you'd be reminded that, that, that the enemy comes and he's the deceiver, but he's the accuser of the brother and he'd love to accuse you. But could you for a moment be reminded that God loves you with an everlasting love and the power of the cross is great enough to spare, to rescue you from your current sins and to keep you on the straight and narrow, and to know that one day you're gonna reap the reward of your faithfulness to God. Hey, I pray today that you walk in the love of Jesus, and may the joy of the Lord be your strength.